experiences, see gaps, advice, and provide the needed support to scale better outcomes. Please, let's give a warm uh, welcome to Dr. Stephen Oluwatobi for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen, for being here. Lovely to have you here. Now we're going to go straight into the very first keynote. So, uh, Dr. Stephen, we'll take your keynote first, then we'll take Harry's keynote next. I'm going to spotlight you um, right away, and then we can have you. The floor is yours, Dr. Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, and great to meet you, Harry. Um, good morning, everyone, depending on your time zone. Um, good to be here, and um, great work you're doing. I'm Emmanuel with the team at host now. Now, um, I hope you all can hear me. If you can hear me, just um, indicate, give like a thumbs up or something, just to confirm you can hear me clearly, everyone. Perfect. Good. Good. Um, all right. So um, let me just jump straight to it so I can use my 20 minutes well. I'm actually looking forward to the Q&A section because um, that's the session that will help me understand um, the questions that people really have, the pain points, and how, how, how best to address um, those. But I'll just, you know, give like an overview um, just to give like um, a background on it. So, all right. Um, so creating a sustainable business foundation during economic shift. That's um, the theme that I that I got. Um, and I'm just trying to pick out uh, two things from there. First is a uh, stable business foundation. Second is the economic shift. Uh, truth be told that there will always be economic shift. So my background is in economics and there's this stuff we call business cycles, meaning that we have the peak periods and then we have, you know, the downtimes, you know, in every economy, you know, this happens, right? So whether it's a boom period or a bust period, whether it's, you know, a recession or whether it's a boom period, so smart investors know that. Those who invest already know that. So they know when to invest. The likes of Warren Buffett will tell you um, that just keep investing. Don't say you're cashing out there. Just keep investing, knowing the timing. Smart business people now understand the timing and see how to level things out. There's this scripture that I love so much. You know, I'm a Christian. And this scripture is in First um, Chronicles 12, 32. And it talks about the sons of Isaac having command over the other tribes because they understood the times. As business people, you must understand the times. What's the pain points? Um, what exactly are people complaining about? If you're a business person, truly really you should be focused on solving people's problems and earning from those problems while focusing on your forte, um, the area that you're really good at and you're, and you're strong at. Um, having this understanding that, okay, there is this thing called business cycles where the economy is, you know, kind of like, you know, um, boom, boss, boom, boss, boom, boss, depending on how, you know, the policies, whether monetary or fiscal that is driving it or how businesses really, really operate and also the kind of problems being solved and the size of the market. Using our own context, market is not is no issue for us because um, we, we are an asset to the world, basically. Nigeria being over 200 million people is an asset to the world. That's why um, no matter how much people think that Nigeria looks like a bad country, um, those who countries and companies that deliver products to Nigeria will always be excited because that's a huge market um, for them. So these are factors that you look at as a business person. Now, um, seeing that and understanding and having that background to help us know that economic shifts should not even be um, a burden or a concern. Now, let me now zoom into uh, more specifically what people might call um, factors responsible for the recent economic shifts. Things like, number one, um, the removal of full subsidy, which of course has led to the increase in full price. And of course, since virtually everything moves, um, everything will also increase in terms of pricing. For instance, look at food. So food coming from the North, uh, from the South or from wherever um, will leverage on physical infrastructure, transportation um, for movement. And since these vehicles you know, use fuel, um, the cost of food will obviously increase. Um, businesses that deliver things also um, will have to, you know, increase delivery costs. Um, every product that's been sold, the price will kind of like, you know, increase. So generally, in economics, we call it inflation, when, you know, prices generally, you know, rise. Um, and this rise, of course, is triggered by something in this case, which is, of course, removal of false subsidy. Um, as a result of that, um, Things are also, you know, changing in some way. So say, for instance, businesses have increased the price of, of their products, but, you know, people don't have their, their income increased yet. People don't have their, their salaries increased yet. So it means the purchasing power um, kind of like is still fixed, but the, the cost kind of like has increased. So people now have to figure out how to shrink their lives into the mold of what that limitation uh, provides. Um, so, so as a business, how, how do you survive this? So that's one, one side. The other side to it is 
another policy that that, that triggered you know um like um volatility in the in the forex market right um just um, was it yesterday or two days ago that um i just um made requests to get some some dollars and i was hearing that it has increased to 995 i don't know what it is today so just you know just five now to hit 1000 I, I need to check today's updates to know exactly what it is um now um the if you want to get a product in in dollars for instance now and maybe the kind of business you do is is the kind that um, you need dollars to act, to actually run and operate um and um let's say it's it's 500 dollars and maybe um, last week you got it at 930 dollars i mean 930 naira to a dollar um at 500 and now you're hearing you know two days ago that it is 995 uh naira to a dollar now that particular product didn't change in terms of you know the cost which is the 500 dollars but um foreign exchange you know kind of like took effect so um how are you going to survive as a business and um pushing that responsibility to the customers you know will still keep you in business so these are um things that trigger the shifts in the economy. So how do you um, basically survive this as an entrepreneur? Because these are problems these problems that are um, you can't control, but you have to build systems around that and hedge that. So this would be my advice in that. Number one, um, economic shift or no economic shift, your business should have a very clear and solid foundation if you're going to survive. And this is what I mean. Um, you are not just in business just to um, focus on survival. And I will use the Maslow's hierarchy of needs to explain this. At the base of that pyramid um, is, is, is what we call physiological needs. Everybody running a business is running a business for either of the reasons on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So anybody who's running a business, for instance, for the sake of meeting his or her physiological needs, I can tell you what will happen to you because I won't run business, you know, with that kind of mindset, right? You won't survive. Your foundation will collapse. Your business will collapse because your reason for running business is based on your physiological needs. Now, the next level of that hierarchy is security, all right? Um, and which talks about safety whether it is job security as the case may be. So if your reason for running a business is just, you know, to be secure, um, you also most likely will not survive <laughs> because um, the pressure of survival will kill the business and ultimately kill you. Now, the next level of that is where building business really begins. And, and what I'm pointing out to here is the proper foundation that makes us a great entrepreneur to build a business that will last. And the next level is where you really start doing business. And that is the level where you begin to understand that true wealth is in people, where you begin to build and foster healthy relationships that will make you build healthy businesses, relationships with investors, relationship with customers, relationship with employees, relationship with partners, relationship with suppliers, suppliers that can even overlook you know, certain costs and even give you the product ahead of time because you have built relationship. So that is where the real um, place for building a proper foundation of a business comes in. And I'm referring to you, the, the, the entrepreneur now, uh, because you're the leader of the team. So first of all, is to get your motivation right. This, you know, adds to the foundation. The second thing that I believe adds to the foundation is um, the kind of problem they are really trying to solve. Even though there's an economic shift, I mean, the more the intensity of the economic shift, the bigger the problem. And whether you like it or not, no matter how intense an economic um, shift is, uh, people don't want to die. So people must solve their problem of hunger. People don't want to be sick. So people must solve their problem of health. Uh, people don't want to stay strapped so they solve their problem of, of mobility. Um, those that have cars, they want to park their cars. So does transportation business fly? If you're in transport business, how in, what kind of innovation can you bring into the fore? So, um, and this brings me to the fact that you need to understand the kind of problem you're solving and see to it that it's a problem that is worth solving because people pay to have that problem solved, no matter the economic situation, no matter the economic shift, no matter the economic condition, people will always pay to have that problem solved. Um, see, see, for instance, uh, so I consulted for for a company just at the at the early points of this um, 
this um, economic um, shift issue when the policy um, changed and, and 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 they gave me access to to their numbers and it's interesting that um so some of the things i i found out in, in the process is that even despite that people don't have so much money to spend people are spending so much money on betting like in a week the the the, the amount of money that um a processing platform is processing for one betting company for one betting company or let's even bring together you know the, the uh maybe two betting companies it's 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 averaging in about 10 billion naira every week so just imagine and that is and so 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 if we look at that times let's say four processing um companies um that's like 15 um about 10 10 times 4 that's 40 so just imagine 40 billion being processed um by gaming and betting platforms where is that 40 billion coming from every week it's coming from people right so there's money circulating the economy and people are putting money based on what they value so um this just explains th the fact that um there's so much wealth somewhere but how are you positioned to collect that money what problem are you solving to collect money from the other guy because as a business person, you should understand the kind of problem you're solving and how best are collecting um, that money um, to your own side. So if you're a mechanic, for instance, now, be positioned to solve those who have car problems. People now are thinking of mobility. People are no longer driving. So where are people working? Is it internet that they need? Is it delivery they need? Um, is it that um, th their car is taking more money from them? Maybe you want to take their cars and help them make money with their cars for yourself and for them. As well, since they don't want to drive to the office and they can't afford to be paying the uh, the full stuff. So I, I've seen people who who are saying, "Man, I can't pay car park, you know, to to park my cars in Lagos anymore when I'm going to the office." So they tell the driver, "You can't just be my driver, right? Fuel is high. I need the car to go make money to pay for the fuel." So <laughs> they've turned their cars to Uber. So while they're in the office, the driver is hitching Uber Bolt, you know, around the two apps you know, on the phone, and it's and, and that amount is paying for the fuel. Right. Um, that is one person individual. As a business person, you have to think proactively. What are the problems? And how can you solve those problems for, for other people and for yourself and profit from, from that journey? So this also must go into the foundational depth um they are they are thinking about. Um, while not putting things out of context, um, it's also to consider the aspect of having a great team. Um, because really you can't do it alone. You need a great team. And I don't think um that can really be emphasized. Um, when it's too small in number to achieve anything meaningful, you also need a team that can have your back. Um, you need a team that um, knows exactly what it's doing. You need a growth team. You need a team that has the capacity to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Make sure it's a problem worth solving. One, two, make sure the team you have has the capacity to solve that problem. Um, if not, you'll be investing your own energy babysitting people where you should be getting results. Um, you need a team that has the appetite for growth. You need a team that has the capacity to solve problems. They solve the problems that your business really is centered on solving and that you're earning from. Um, um, also reinforcing the kind of foundation um, ha has to do with vision and, and values. And I think one of the values you should consider is exceptionality. Um, in this age when competition is extremely stiff, you, 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 you don't want to be lost in the crowd, right? Um, you, you need to be seen. And that's where exceptionality comes in. What makes you exceptional? And how can you deliver great products that are exceptional? How can you deliver in a way that is exceptional? Um, how can you position yourself in a way that makes you um, exceptional and people perceive you as exceptional? Uh, because there are many options, so why should they pick you? Um, the reason why they should pick you is because they perceived some level or degree of exceptionality, um, basically, and that's um, crucial. Um, so these um, are my thoughts, basically, uh, and I hope that somebody can pick something around that. Um, finally, I would just say, um, in terms of building a solid foundation, you also want to think of infrastructures that will help you to save costs. Um, so in this age where, you know, costs are rising, transportation costs rising, you might want to leverage on, on technology, for instance, technology infrastructure. So can you, you know, move to the cloud? Um, figure out how to, you know, work, work with your team using the cloud, uh, using things like G Suite, um, for instance, having a website, um, instead of having a physical store where you have to pay rent and all that, you know, and people see your product and then you pay for 
um, and you get your customers to pay for delivery. So leverage on, on technology. Instead of paying uh, a salary that is too high, you can always pay for an app that sorts your uh, your basic stuff from operations to accounting to all that. It's possible to slash your cost by 50% or even more if you can leverage on tech infrastructure that can help you to fly and do like a lot more and what you're doing. So um, in summary, number one, understand that economic shifts are not new. I mean, they've been like since ages. And the um, global economic depression of 1929 has taught us that um, the economy won't correct itself. People have to take, you know, deliberate decisions to take advantage of the wave of whatever depression. And, you know, people actually become richer during such kind of, of, of depressions. For instance, more billionaires have been made in depressions than when the economy is, is in the boom. In history, and facts have proven that. So as a business person, you need to rethink what you're looking at. Next, try to understand the problems that you're solving. Is it a problem worth solving? Is it a pain point? What's the size of the market that has this problem? Because you don't want to solve a problem that um, is only the problem of five persons. And those five persons can only give you like 100 naira for the problems you're solving. I mean, 100 naira times 500 is, is not much money for even one person um, in the in today's Nigeria. So you want to solve a problem um, where, you know, like a million people, 10 million persons, 100 million persons can give you 500 naira for, and then you can get that in recurrence and then you're growing. Also leverage on tech infrastructures that will help you grow. Um, have solid values that keep you in, particularly the value of exceptionality. Have a great team that has your back, that you don't have to babysit. They don't take your time babysitting them. Um, rather, they, they save you time to think because they know what they're doing and they get results. So this uh, summary, I look forward to the Q&A where I believe I'll be able to answer more questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Steven. That was very succinct, but quite insight packed. Um, a few things that I um I took out from what you said, which might be, you know, up for debate is, you know, you, you mentioned that entrepreneurs should not um, you know, have the mindset of um them wanting to do business for psychological needs, um, I mean physiological needs or um security needs. Right. Uh, because that way they tend to think small and then they just want to solve immediate problems and a couple of all those things. Um, the people, the, the majority of people we have in our um, what's it called in our community here are small businesses. Um, so that means a lot of them are probably still doing business, not because they just want to eat, but they're doing that to support their livelihood as well. Right. Um, they might not necessarily be established tech companies who have raised money and then, you know, can decide, OK, let's focus on growth or scale. They're still trying to even stabilize their business. So that would pose me to, to begin to, I mean, look at it. If they've not eaten, I mean, we've not eaten, we don't have a three square meal. We still struggle for what the rent for the business would be this year, where it's going to come from and a couple of all those things. How am I supposed to start thinking big when, I mean, I see how small problems to solve. And then especially in times like this, those small problems seem to be big problems now. I mean, those are some questions that I have. There are a couple of things you shared. I, I would also need clarity on, but much later when we get to the panel session, um, we'll do well to you know, to get to get those. So thank you so much, Dr. Steven. Um, we're now going to to um, go over to Harry and um, have Harry's keynote as well. And then immediately after Harry's keynotes, we'll launch straight into the Q&As. I can see some questions in the chat section. We also have some questions that have been sent in earlier. So we'll just take everything together, definitely. Um, so Harry, uh, I'm going to, you know, yield the mic to you now, if you can, um, you know, um, uh, on mute your video is that the way we call it yes if you can oh what I, I can't remember the english we used to use but anyways yes shall i show your video and then you know i'm going to spotlight you and you have the next 20 minutes for us you're welcome harry can we give a digital welcome to harry everybody just have that digital welcome 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 yeah all right thanks everyone thanks once again um uh, thanks for the opportunity to the host now now team thanks for having me and before I continue, I want to quickly thank uh, Dr. Steven for a remarkable session. I learned a lot myself there. Um, I have a slide to share just to help me stay scripted. Um, how can I do that? You can just go ahead and share your screen. You should have access to do that. Okay. Okay, so please let me know if you can see my slides. Can you see the slides? 
Yes, we can. We can see. All right. I mean, it's nothing serious. Just put a few things together to help um, um, gather my thoughts better. Yes. So, um, I'm. I mean, Doctor Stephen has said a lot. So I'm not going to try to buttress on so many things. Yeah. The market is the reality is that the market is very tough. Inflation is high due to so many factors. And um, the global VC market for fundraising too so is also very bad. Even access to just normal for small businesses to small businesses is kind of very tough to assess such things right now for businesses. Yeah. So what does this mean for businesses in Nigeria? Yeah. So reduce buying power for customers. That means um, people are able to. People have lower capacity to actually spend on more things outside of the essential things they need to buy. Yeah. Um, increased cost of doing business. Um, if you are building a business or running a business currently, you attest to the fact that you probably are spending more in executing or pushing that particular business. Lower profit margins as a result. If the cost of doing business is higher, if you and you are not, it is not, and uh, you can't, you don't have the luxury of changing or upgrading your pricing. Obviously, has an, an impact on how much profit you can make, or even if at all you are from that business. Uh, business in in Naira and having to for these are for people who are currently. Um, having to maybe raise funds or having to send reports to investors. Doing business in Naira and reporting in US dollars is a mess right now. Yeah. Or even having to do business in Nigeria, where you have to pay for certain things in US dollars and you have to now do business in Naira. So it's really, really tough. Yeah. Um, if there are any, if there's anyone like that in this call, on this call, you could just signify letting me know that, oh, these are some of the pains you are currently dealing with. You probably have to pay for certain things. So, okay, you probably have to pay for certain things in dollars. Then you now have to now do your transactions in Naira. It's just a mess, yeah? And also, there's another reality of losing top staff to, to Jackpa, the reality of Jackpa, yeah? As a matter of fact, before this call, I just finished from a long call with someone from our programs team who is leaving for UK tomorrow, yeah? Uh, I mean, she's been with us for for a while now and um, she's moving to uk for her masters yeah so uh there's that reality for whether or no matter the size of business if you're having to work with top people there's a reality of, of losing them to other countries yeah so um so how do i how do you a stable business in a time like this man i don't know too <laughs> All. that's just me on a lighter note here yeah. my personality finds a way of just coming into my conversations no matter how serious it gets so let's get let's be more serious now yes so one of the most important things you have to do right now is understand your customer yeah um who are your customer it's possible the people you assumed were your customers earlier in the year or even last year are probably no longer your customers yeah uh, due to the economic reality um what are the what are their current needs not the ones not the needs you assume what are the current needs of people who fit into that profile of your actual customers it's important to keep reevaluating these things yeah how are they currently catering for those needs those those are very key questions you you need to have actual answers to whatever business you are building and whatever the size of business you are building at this particular point in time yeah and what is the buying power of your current actual customer? Yeah, um, it's important to know their buying power and not the one you have assumed. Yeah, so um, if you are not selling like essential goods or essential services, um, you need to know what is the buying power of these people you are catering for and how to make adjustments to meet that reality. Yeah, so um, uh, this is one of the key things you need to have in on lockdown to navigate these times. Like Dr. Stephen has said, there will be many more economic downs. This is just one of them. There have been quite a number of them in recent decades. Yeah. So it is not about being, I mean, I'm, 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 it is not about being negative. It's just the reality of things. There is always that cycle. Um, and uh, when it comes to economic um, situations, interest. Um, I had, uh, so there's this excerpt from Market Sizing by Dr. Ola Brown, where 
she did a, she did like a whole a very detailed write up about the actual Nigerian market because a lot of times people who are building businesses, especially startup folks, we the startup people, we tend to just throw in data into our pitch deck. The the market we are with the market size is so 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 it is so three billion this and, and most of these things are really not the actual reality of the market most times yeah we just put all those bagladash on our day on our deck just to bobo people who don't really know about the market too so they have to just fall back to whatever they are seeing on that deck but dr labra is someone who has so many business interests in, in, in this region so as a result she had to do a deeper dive into the market you can go and google market size i i, I took time to now further improve on that data by doing even a deeper research, you have to now kind of create my own data from this. I have, so I have a detailed document on this. If you need access to it, you let me know. I can share with you. I'll share with the host now now team here. Yeah. Normally, I should charge for that, but it took me a lot of time to do that research. But that's fine. Yeah. So the, the we have the first category of <clears throat> we which we call the Nigeria one as the elite category. They earn about ten million upwards annually. And there are just 2 million of these people in Nigeria, despite the fact that we are about, about 200 million people in the country. Yeah, there's a middle class. And, and uh, the middle class earns about a million to, mm. say, around 10 million every, every year. There are about 82 million of these. <clears throat> and there's a the lower class who earns way less than 1 million every year. And there are about 90 million of these. It's important. The reason I'm sharing this is it's important to understand where your actual customer into this so, into this chart and know how to allocate that for them. A lot of times, um, I see so many businesses just built on so many assumptions. Maybe the assumptions were right last year. Maybe the assumptions were right when you started. But a lot of those assumptions might have changed because so many things have changed. Yeah, even in this chart, yeah, there is in each of these categories, there is still the lower upper, mid, lower middle upper for the elite, for the middle, for the lower class. So when you understand where your customer actually fits in, if you are catering for the elite people, which means you are selling things around the luxury offering and things like that, obviously you your business model cannot be built around you cannot you should not be catering for people in that category with a lower class strategy. If your market is actually the lower class, you should not be catering for them with the elite class strategy. And if your market is the middle class and several categories of middle class, you should understand that it's different from the, the elite market or from the lower class market. So you should understand their motivation, where they are, what they're trying to achieve, and how you can position to cater for their current needs. Because at the end of the day, a business is only existing because people are paying for your service, people are using your products, yeah, at a scale that keeps that business alive and above the water. And even beyond that, at a scale that now makes you keep achieving your business goal. Your business goal might be to grow from maybe um, uh, um, a, a hundred users to a thousand or even to get your first 10 customers. Depending on your actual reality, if you are just getting your first set of customers or you're actually scaling or you're expanding into or people who are building SMEs here, and SMEs is actually the, the, oxy the oxygen of the economy, to be honest, yeah? So I, I, I admire people who are building businesses here, SMEs, MSMEs, yeah? Se providing services to people. Yeah, you are actually like part of the real life wire of the economy. So it's important that you understand these things, understand your users, so you know how to get better for them. Yeah, I, I can't dwell so much on this right now because of the time I have, I can share that resource. So a stable business is built. There are so many things stable businesses are built on, but I'm just going to focus on two key things that if you get this right, it, there's a very strong chance for you to keep achieving the things you have set out to achieve, even in times like this. Customers, yeah? At the end of the day, it's really about customers. It's about people who you're actually catering for. You don't have customers, you really don't have a business. That's good, yeah? Uh, if you have customers, then... You have a business. I, I we always have this discussion in house that and man, if you if you are able to, so there's this principle from Y Combinator where we tell you focus on your first hundred customers or your first hundred users who really okay. No, there's this quote from um, the founder of Airbnb where he says it is better to have just hundred users who really love your product and your service than having a thousand users who kind of like your product. They are not really, really into your product or service. But so which means that they are flicked. They, they can easily, if they see something that 
they can easily change their mind and move on from what you are doing. But if you have 100 people who are really loyal, they love your product, they use it over and over and even recommend to their people, that means you have good fans. It is easy to now get 100 more or 10 more from where each of these 100 are actually coming from. Yeah, so it's important to, while we all want to scale, we all want to become, there's this very common link with the startup world now of, in, I'm building the next unicorn. We are going to become a unicorn in the next so so much and all of that. Those are very nice goals to have. Yeah. I want to build unicorns too. Yeah. But the, the reality of it is that it starts from having customers who are it's, who really love the products. Yeah. They can like it is your product is a go-to solution for them whenever they are trying to solve that particular problem. Another key thing you need to be able to focus on in times like this is the product and service. You, Focus on your product or the service you are offering. Make sure that you understand your product well and you keep learning new things about your products better than you knew the previous day, better than you knew the previous quarter. Yeah, because the truth is times are changing, humans' needs are changing, human psychology is changing. So you need to understand your product in ways that meets the current new realities of who you're actually dealing with. Yeah. Um, spend less time on, on the nice to have spend less time on the nice to have the nice to have are things there are so many things that are nice to have for different businesses depending on the business and your business size and business reality so i'm not going to use my personal bias on what a nice to have is you would know what is what you would know for your business you know what is essential you know what is a nice to have for your business so uh, spend less time on the nice to have and spend more time on the most important things your customers your products keep improving on your products experience people have when they interact with your products or the experience they have when they interact with your service because it is that experience they are going to talk about when they are talking about talking about your business with other people you see certain businesses where you come online on twitter and you see people just come in to come and we have that experience in trefford a lot where people come online on twitter to come and just talk about trefford come on linkedin talk about trefford and you will think we probably maybe gave them money to do that behind the scenes yeah i was People reached out to me um, during the first platform of the year, during Workers' Day. People were people were sharing screen. They were sharing images with me. There was a speaker at the platform who was talking and referenced Trefford as a place for people to gain non-technical skills in tech space. And I'm like, I don't know this speaker. Yeah, God bless him, but I don't know him. I don't have any relationship with him. So the truth is, when you build something that solves people's problem that people really like, that is really touching that soft spot in people's heart, people who want to propagate the gospel of whatever you are building. That is where you really need to be. Yeah. Um, it is nice to have a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand customers, but you need to focus on building a very loyal customer base because those people will propagate whatever it is you are actually selling to them and bringing other people. In at Trefford, we have alumni who pay for other people to come and learn at Trefford. They pay for their family members to come and learn at Trefford. They pay for members of their team to come and learn at Trefford. Time and time and time over again. Even in the early days, we are seeing our early days. So even when we think or we don't have so much marketing budget per se, we've been able to enjoy a lot of goodwill of our users who are like our core evangelists at Trefford. Yeah? So um, um, it's important to spend more time on that and less time on. There are so many things that eventually fall into place at the later stage of your business. But you need to know that you need to have a business for you to now start having those other things. Yeah, I'm so I'm so tempted to touch a few things, but I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So what are the skills you need to have as a founder in these times or as a business person in these times? Yeah, because really the business starts with you. Yeah. So um, one of the first things you need to have, one of the most important skills, you need, one of the most important skills you need to have is sales. You need to learn how to sell and products. I've touched on that already. Then ability to pivot, which is something I'm going to dwell on the more. Yeah. So on sales, you need to learn how to sell to customers, sell your product, sell the experience of a product to customers. Yeah. We talked about that already. You need to learn how to sell to prospective hires who you are bringing in to work with you. Yeah. It is important that you know that when you are now to, you are entering that space of having to hire very competitive set of people, other people are also trying to bring them on board to build stuff for them in their companies too. So there are times it's not just about the money. There are times about the vision and how they see themselves in that vision. So if you cannot sell this to people, you might not be able to assess some of the top talents. Yeah. So it's important you just don't learn how to sell to customers. You learn how to sell to talents. It's also important you learn how to sell to investors. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, 
um, you need the investors to invest in your business to scale whatever it is you are doing, to test or experiment whatever it is you are doing. Yeah, our earliest set of investors at Trefford, and you, you heard what Dr. Stephen said about the importance of relationships. Our earliest set of investors at Trefford were just purely based on people I have built very solid relationships with during the course of my career. In fact, some of them are people who I, I was probably maybe their earliest or their first set, their, like first manager for them in their tech career. Yeah, this when these people knew, oh, oh, Harry is eventually pivoting to building something. Yeah, one of the first things they wanted to do was, man, we are willing to back whatever it is you are building. We don't even want to know the details of that idea, but we are going to invest. So it's important you also have build that relationship. But also, when I'm talking about sales here, you need to also learn how to sell to institutional investors. Then at the same time, you need to, one key thing that is always missing, I've noticed amongst business people is, you need to not just also sell to the first three people, you need to learn how to resell to your existing staff, your existing team. A lot of times we sell to customers, to hires, to investors, but the truth is, the vision you sold to people you brought on board earlier on, maybe last year, maybe earlier this year, that vision might have changed, yeah? So it's important for you to keep reselling the vision of your business to people you are even working with. Because at the end of the day, if they leave you, you, don't, you cannot do the whole business on your own. So you need to, as the vision is up, it's been updated, as changes are being made to the initial idea and assumption you had about your business, resell your business to your team. Resell the business to your business partners. Resell the business to the key people you have on team. Because it is important they see that vision. These most successful businesses are businesses where you have people who now come on board and own the vision. Yeah? We had a some we had the first local tech summit in Africa last year. We're having the second edition of that summit in a few months' time. And I in fact, I was my involvement in making that app. Yes, I initiated the whole movement in sharing the vision, making people buy into that vision. But in terms of execution, the running around and making every lot of things happen, I was fairly involved. The team and even our partners just took it up from there. And that was because I was able to sell that vision to them. So it's important you learn how to sell. When you can sell vision to people, at times they might not even now just be in it for the money. They might be in it because they also see themselves in that vision and they now own it or they own that vision with you. It's important you learn how to do that more than ever before. Yeah? Products. Know your products and service. Engage users to know what they think. Always spend more time talking with your users. Spend more time engaging with your customers. Apart from selling to them, hear from them. Get honest feedback about what, about what they really think about your service, about the experience, and areas you can actually make improvements on. If, if you spend, you are on the right track when you spend more time interacting with your customers, yeah? Because the truth is you get so much, in fact, you get so much data and so much product roadmap from just continuously interacting with your users. Because these are the people who would keep using your products, basically. And they are the ones you are building for, yeah? Never stop learning about your products. Never stop learning about your products. Keep updating your knowledge about the market, about the terrain, about similar products even in other regions about similar products in regions that are very close to your region? Has someone built something like what you are building before? How, how, what kind of sources? What is the scale they achieve? What is the, what is the biggest kind of business in your sector, in the world? Yeah, on my wall here, in my workspace, I have a sticky note that contain, that shows, I think the 10 most valuable ed tech startups in the world. Yeah, so I have them, I know, their, I know the valuation of all those businesses, I know the region, I know what they are doing. On my wall here, on my sticky notes, I'm pointing, putting my hands on the startups who are doing things at the scale that I think we really want to do at Trefford, that have actually had product market fit in a way we also want to emulate. So I'm always studying them, checking out what they are doing. Yeah, so you need to understand your product on this level and understand even the future possibilities of your product. So you can sell those things to your team, you can sell those things to your investors, you can sell those things to prospective hire. People want to be part of something that grows, not something that is stagnant. So the more you learn about your product, the more you know how to move. And the most important thing I'm going to talk about today is pivot. Yeah, this is perhaps the greatest skill to have after sales. Times change, your users needs change, market changes. So why should you not change? Yeah, why should you not change? If everything is changing, why should you not change? So the most successful companies that stood the test of time have pivoted multiple times. The most successful companies 
that have stood the test of time. The Apples, the Microsoft, the Google, the Amazon, they have pivoted multiple times. Amazon is not what it is. Amazon started as an online bookstore before they became an online store for everything. Yeah. Um, Google started as a, a, yes, a search engine and now they have pivoted into so many other things. So it's important for you to learn how to pivot. It's important for you to know, learn how to make adjustments. And the reason is this. Um, what you initially thought was a profitable business idea when you started can no longer be profitable be a profitable business idea now. Yeah. So you need to make sure you are adjusting your business or even shifting your entire business to now meet the current reality. The ability to do this is one of the greatest skills to have as a business person, the ability to pivot. Because it involves getting withdrawing your emotional attachment from the initial idea you had. And that is one hard thing for us to do as business people. You know, when you have an idea, you are emotionally attached to the idea, you have shared that vision and all of that. You want to make it happen at all costs. And at times, that might just not be the right business idea at that particular point. It's a good business idea. It might, not be the, it might not just be the right idea for that time. So your ability to make this adjustment is very, very important to the success of your business. So it's important that you really le learn how to pivot. Sit down and ask yourself very tough. To pivot, you need to ask yourself very tough questions. What is the ceiling of this business? What is the highest ceiling of this business in terms of what, how far can this business go? Yeah. What if we, if we are repositioning this business? What are there better realities or better higher ceiling? Is there really a large market for what the problem we are trying to solve? Or I just assumed that market initially. So you, you need to keep asking these questions. And that is why the other things that I said are very important. The more you understand your products, the more you understand your users, the more you understand the market and the direction the market is headed, the better and the easier it is for you to actually make decisions on how to now move forward. Yeah, we are consistently involving our Trefford. Um, we initially started with physical cohorts, then COVID hit. Yeah, I didn't know I was going to share this example. COVID hit then at the time. And by the time COVID was hitting, we had that, by that time, we actually we already had a plan for the next year where we are going to roll out physical trainings across Nigeria and even Ghana. Yeah, and COVID started, COVID just started creeping in gradually. And I asked the team at the time that what happens when this COVID eventually leads to a total lockdown nationwide, where we cannot hold physical events. But when I predicted this, it had not even happened. It was after this prediction, I think the following week or two weeks after that was when government said there's going to be a, a lockdown. You can no longer have physical events or gathering of more than social number of people. Yeah. So everything just played out that way. And I started making adjustments. Everything we, in fact, Everything we initially planned about Trefford, we made an entire adjustment of moving online. How do we create a learning experience online? How do we create a learning experience where people can learn online and things like that? And we just, I, I created a document that shared with the team. We, we, we reached out to, like, to my network of people in the tech space, brought them on board as facilitators, and they were like, it's easier for me to even join this, to, to take part in this. I cannot travel from Germany to come and take a session for you. It might be very hard. But because this is virtual, from my room in Germany, I can actually take a session. I can take one two sessions. And we realized that people joined our, now we have, people have joined different Trefford courses from more than, I think, 15 countries, yeah, and more than 30 cities around the world. And it was because, and by the time we did that then, it was actually the first fully virtual product-related training in Africa at the time, yeah, before every other person has started adopting the online model. We had to test the water on behalf of every other person. Yeah, so, and that was because I was willing to pivot. And now we have been able to do things at a greater scale than we would have done if it was physical because of the limitations involved in being physical. Yeah, so, and we have stuck to that online model. Every other learning institution have stuck to that online model. More people have now come into the space to now do, and I'm, I'm excited to see more people come into the space because it, it is showing that it is validating the fact that there is a market and there is an opportunity. Yeah, so um, you need to learn how to pivot. You need to learn how to make adjustments. Yeah, let me give another, the case study actually put on this call, on, on this is number. Number, uh, these are also OAU people. In fact, the person in blue in this slide, I my final year project was a continuation of his own project, which was my senior colleague in school. So I actually improved on his own project, yeah, as my own final year project. Yeah. And the other person here was my next door roommate in school. 
yeah, which so these are the co-founders of Kudi, of currently called Number, but the, the, the company should be called Kudi. Yeah, Kudi started as an AI bot that helps you make basic transactions like buying airtime, paying NEPA bills, and things like that. That was the origin of this business. And with that model, they entered by Combinator, where Combinator funded them. And within first one, within the within one year of operating as an AI bot, they saw there was an opportunity in agency banking where people could actually now come do transaction instead of going to bank that they could actually go to an and carry out transaction. The other was doing at the time. They saw there was an opportunity for them to position away, and they positioned eventually as creating the the operating system for um for POS agents to actually carry out their business successfully. They did that, they scaled again from AI bots. They did that, they scaled again into having over 30,000 agents across Nigeria, where you can go to different states in Nigeria and you see a Kudi agent, mobile money agent, where you can withdraw money even where there's no bank. And they made massive, generated massive revenue, processed mass, mad numbers when it comes to transaction per month. Kudi probably processes over a, a process probably up to a million dollars in revenue, if not more, every other month. Like it tens, probably even tens of millions of dollars monthly. Yeah. Then after that, again, they saw that this is a ceiling for this market we have entered. And with that, they raised their, they raised their um, they raised their seed round. Yeah, they raised their seed round of about the, maybe five million dollars or so. Then with that again, they saw there's a bigger ceiling again that we position as the central operating system for businesses generally, where we not just for POS people who are trying to withdraw money, but let us now build the technology that powers businesses where you can now do transactions with our like operating system as a business, regardless of the size, small or large. Yeah, they added that to their business and repositioned from Udi to becoming number. And the number name suits them because this time around they are not just processing um a transaction for mo for for a mobile agents. They are process. They are now the, like um, operating system for businesses generally, regardless of the site. Yeah. And yet again, from that they were able to raise their their Series A. I think of over thirty million dollars. Yeah. Now catching for even a way bigger market. The greatest thing in this, the greatest lesson here is the fact that these people were never emotionally attached to. Each of the ideas, no matter how good those ideas were, they were able to always make necessary changes, necessary adjustments to advocate for even bigger problems. Yeah, so um, if you can do that regardless of the sector, regardless of the size of your business, trust me, you are going to build a business that lasts and stand the test of time. Yeah, right. whatever you've been doing right now, you might just realize that continuous interaction with your users you might not be solving the real problem that they have and that they'll be willing to spend on, even spend more money on. Yeah, so pivoting. Yeah, if you don't take any other thing from this conversation, take pivot. Do that mindset of the ability to pivot, and it starts with you. Pivoting doesn't start with your team, it starts with you, it starts with your mindset. You need to have that growth mindset and the willingness to actually adapt to current realities and changes. Yeah, so um, uh, keep moving by all means, just the go. Yeah, uh, in the words of Potty, one of my favorite YouTube creators, thanks for having me. And um, I hope this was worth your time. Thank you. Whoa. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Guys, can I get some digital uh, feedback for that session? That was quite very power packed. I think we would, we would definitely need to have, um, you know, uh, demystification of a couple of things from the things you shared. You basically, just like Dr. Steven, you shared insights that some people would still need, like, you know, extra um, explanation to grab. But I mean, that was really power part. Thanks for um, shedding light on what the business themselves can do, you know, from the from focusing on the products and then sales and then the target market, as well as knowing when to pivot as it is. Um, we're going to go straight to the Q&A. So if Dr. Steven and Ari can uh, please turn back their video on. Um, and then we'll take the Q&As right away. So, Harry, Dr. Steven, please do turn on your videos. I'm going to spotlight um, uh, both of you now. A few seconds, few seconds, few seconds, few seconds. Da, 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 da. Okay, 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 okay. All right. So, um, building businesses. I mean, it's not beans. This 2020 minutes that you guys have used to share 
some of these things. Um, it's not as simple as it is. I, I'll say it that way. And I, I want to start from the very last thing that Ari mentioned, which is to know when to pivot and how that um, entrepreneurs can be passionate about their solutions, right? Um, and have been here, I've been there, done that. Um, you're so passionate because you know, oh, this is what I want to do. It gives me meaning. It gives me purpose and all of that. But the business is struggling to stay alive, right? Um, so what's the what's the balance? What's, let me put this, what's the difference between resilience in business, you know, doing all you can to get it to work, and stupidity? Let me just let me put it that way simply. What's the difference? What's the, what's the line between resilience in business and stupidity as it is? Um, Harry, you can answer this question one minute very quickly, then I'll ask um I'll need Dr. Simon to also answer the question. What's the business, what the difference between resilience and stupidity? Data. Right. That's just the word data. When your decisions are data driven, you know. You understand the road. You kind of have more understanding of some. You are able to predict the road ahead if it's something worth navigating. Yeah, and I, I, trust me, I'm not pivoting. Does not mean stopping your business because the the there are challenges. Pivoting means making data driven decisions to move to make position your business for better opportunities. Yeah, and all of that skewed on data. Yeah, so. Data would let you know if you are on the right path, if there's a market for it, based on what the appetite for of users. And data would let you know if you should move on. So data is a difference. Beautiful. I've got follow-up questions for that. I'll wait until Dr. Steven answers his bit. Okay, thanks a lot. And that was um, awesome, Harry. Um, so just to, to, to write on what Harry said, it's actually um, learning. So my own way of responding to, to, to the same question is, is um so as an entrepreneur you have to consistently be learning as a startup founder you have to be consistently be learning and learning in this case is what harry said data pay attention to what the feedback is um customer feedback is data um your revenue is data um the level of transaction is data uh, when the numbers are giving you the numbers are basically giving you certain signs already so what are you going to do are you going to stay stupid <laughs> or you will learn from what you know the numbers are, are telling you. So it's basically learning. And most organizations, just like number was was as, as a case study, you know, have gone through that journey. In fact, um, this basic technique, you know, the lean startup methodology, which is you know, is a preferred you know uh, platform that 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 I refer to, is because usually when people want to you know to start companies, there are, there are two parts, and that depends on the volume of resources you have. You either blitz scale, or you just want to go the lean startup you know model way. Which is you have that idea, you don't know whether um the market really wants it. So you just want to do like a minimum value product uh, where you just spend a little amount of money to test in the market. The essence of testing is to get, you know, feedback, get facts, get data to make a decision, right? So if the numbers are telling you that people really want this, right, then you know, hey, this is what to go. Let's invest some money to build the proper infrastructure to now scale this, right? If the numbers are telling you this is not it, then that's where pivoting comes in, right? Let's now pivot and test, right? The, the numbers are telling us as um, this isn't working, so we pivot. We try that again, ship again to the market before you even invest in full-blown tech development, all right? Mm -hmm. You pivot again, you check, you test. The numbers are telling you that, hmm, they seem not you know, to, to, to like this, then something really is wrong. And I think it's, it's, it's a wrong question to be asking, would you buy this product? No. The way you know is when they pay for it or they don't pay for it, right? Or if you want to ask a question at all, it's how much would you pay? Uh, for it not will you pay for this so the kind of questions you want to ask as an entrepreneur matters and how you want to do that matters and asking the question does not mean just going there to ask verbally or to you know to send out the form which of course is okay but basically putting your minimum value product to the market and see you know if people actually you know will use this and even pay to actually use this now as you get feedback and feedback in this case is how they're using it how they're paying for it how long they are staying on it um Maybe, you know, they're even, you know, getting in touch with you. Can this thing actually do this? They're even giving you ideas of how to improve the product. Then you are, you are seeing something there. So just go with an open mind as an entrepreneur where you have an idea. You're building a product. Go, go with an open mind and don't stay fixated, right? 
getting fixated, you know, can end up, you know, uh, making you lose everything. And then you're realizing later because somehow people, you know, most people try to want to get smarter when, you know, they are getting low on cash. Then they start getting smarter as to how to allocate resources. You know, before you get to that point, you want to learn from what the numbers are telling you and then improve basically from that. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Steven. Thank you, Harry. So the 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 common thing with what both of you just said is data, gather data, learn. Um, now, there are so many things that impact, you know, um, businesses and how how your business would thrive, either it's successful or not. Now, when we say let's gather data, what, what, what about issues where the data we're even trying to pull together, we're not getting the right set of data? First of all, we know that the country in itself is not a um, is not a very data driven environment right we're not so conscious about gathering data storing data and you know analyzing data using that to make decisions so we can't even find some certain data out there take for instance um harry shared with us today the the rough um estimate of what the middle class low class middle class and high class nigerians look like right um so let's say for instance you're trying to build a product for the middle class and then these are people that earn I think 1 million per annum to 10 million per annum, right? And your product is supposed to be about 50,000 Naira. But you know from, let me put it this way, from insight or from, I don't know, there's something we call a priori in um, in uh, in psychology. It's like, you should just know it's like, you just know it's that people should be able, these guys should be able to afford 50,000 Naira for this product. But not many people are affording it, right? Some people have bought it, but not many people are buying it. Now, should you look at that data you have, the numbers, and say, oh, okay, so not many people are buying it. Um, that's probably because they can't afford it. Or should you begin to consider other things like, am I not you know, reaching out to the right target market? Am I not communicating the right way? Or is the product in a way in itself not you know, providing the solution? You know, Because you have to look at all these things. So how do you begin to look at all of these things together to know what data is important per time that would help you make informed decision? Um, Harry, I want you to answer this question. I hope you got you, you, under, you understand what the question is. How do you begin to look at all the various, you know, elements that you can possibly get data from and then figure out, okay, which one is most important to say, okay, because of this reason, we probably should pivot or we should change our product or we should change this or we should change that? Uh, so, yeah, it's that's a very good question. And um, the way I have done this over time is to, like Dr. Steven said, I'm, man, I'm, I think the only thing I'm really addicted to is learning. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly learning. If you interact with me today on a particular subject matter, yeah, if you interact with me again in 24 hours to 48 hours on that same subject, subject matter, I have learned something new if I have that conversation with you again. Yeah, so um, as business people, it's one thing you cannot really shy away from. Yes, it, currently, the kind of infrastructure we have means that there are not readily available data that you can easily access. Yeah, but there are still ways around this. There are platforms that actually provide some data about the African market and Nigeria inclusive. Sometimes you you might really have to invest. Yeah, data is money. Yeah, having access to data is power for you as a business. And at times, this the investment might not be much, but at times it might cost you to have certain information that makes you make the right decision. Yeah, so it might not cost, and some of the time that cost might not be money. That cost might be time. There are resources available online. Just leveraging on Google. Google the most, I Google the most, I Google almost anything possible. Like a lot of things I have learned, I have learned them via Google, YouTube, just asking questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, let me, I've Googled something as funny as in my very early days as a HR and operations person in tech. Yeah. I remember Googling how to manage a staff dealing with heartbreak. Yeah, <laughs> because it, it might sound very funny, but I was dealing with that reality at the time with a, one of our top software engineers whose partner broke his heart at the time or said him breakfast. 
Yeah. And he couldn't focus at work again. I, I'm like, there's no manual that told me how to handle the situation. I had to mm -hmm. go and Google to know how to manage this. So really, Google is your friend. Google is a, 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 a and you eventually learn to start seeking data, seeking like accurate data from the wrong data, and stay curious enough to keep asking people questions, ask questions from your customers, study people doing similar business to yours, and see what you can learn from them. Yeah, study other markets, see the things you can pick out from those markets. Yeah, then at times you might have to pay some form of money to assess certain kind of data about your market. Or pay in terms of time. More often than not, you pay in time than even money because it will take you time to sit down and digest this data. It's not a lot of this information are online, they are free, but most times we don't just have the time to go through them. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Harry. So let's let's shift a little bit from the things that you can control to the things that you probably cannot control as um, you know, as as a business person or an entrepreneur in say Nigeria, for instance. Um, to what extent uh does and Dr. Sivin, this is to you, to what extent does politics, policy, and governance affect uh building businesses in Nigeria? To what extent do you expect that maybe whatever the government says will affect my business and, and stuff like that. And also, as a side question to this, is Nigeria in a recession? That's that's a side question too. Is Nigeria in a recession? That's one. And then secondly, to what extent does politics, policy, and governance affect businesses? Okay. Um. Maybe before I answer that, let me just you know corroborate on some of the things that that that, that Harry said, um, regarding the question that um you you asked. Um, on that, to be very honest, particularly if you are bringing something that really has the potential to become a unicorn, um, because a unicorn mostly will be coming from like market creating innovations. Possibly, um, nothing really has has solved that problem. You know, like like it should be solved like now. So yeah. oftentimes, you can't even find you data really um outside there. You might only find like proxies. Um, so what you want to do in this case is to generate data by taking action. So there is this thing that I learned from some of my friends in the US who who build um who have built like great companies like tech companies. Um, it's called act, learn, build. Like you you don't want to gather data. You take action. Is your action that's generating the data? Yeah. <laughs> action. You create that minimum viable product. Start. Be learning from your action. That learning is what is giving you the data with your minimum viable product from the lessons you are building, right? Let's pick the Airbnb guys, for instance, as an example. When this guy started, there was nothing like that. I mean, who will actually give you a spare room for you to come and stay in his house? How do you want to scale that? That never existed. So when they went to um, one community for the first time, they actually rejected them. Paul Graham directly rejected them from entering Y. Uh, combinator because I mean it doesn't make sense like who is going to open you know his house and say because I have a spare room um uh, I want to make it available you know then but don't forget when this happened was um was 2008 when the financial you know um, economic global meltdown actually took place so people needed extra cash then so it was just good timing right and these guys just refused to die because I mean and this comes to the question you asked me before Harry came in, where you were mentioning something about how do you balance, you know, meeting your physiological needs with. So I'll pick the Airbnb guys too as an example, right? Um, they were not making money. They only had, they only made money once, and that was because of an event, right? So it's a design weekend. There was an event. People came from all over the US, some from all over the world, you know, coming to um, California for the particular event. And so they just bought like Airbed and then just you know to get people sorted out so they made money at that time but now event is over money wasn't coming in so they said to sell cereal to survive now this brings the question of managing building a business that will outlive, outlive you that will last and also managing survival right and that's the aspect of figuring out how to survive doing everything most companies i mean if this guy um any other of uh, of um, team apps now, now money point will tell you his experience also i mean Engineering jobs for anybody to survive while you're building Team Apt, when it was still Team Apt, right? So if you're starting a startup, understand your survival points, understand building a business. If not, you're going to kill both. You won't survive, and most likely business will not survive, all right? So um, Act, Learn, Build is my answer to that. Generate the data, learn from it, and grow. 
and see Airbnb today now. It's um, the last time I checked, it was valued at 30 billion, about 30 billion US dollars in, in, in valuation. Um, now to, 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 to your question, um, which is basically centered around um, do policies and regulations play a matter? Yes, of course, yes, it does. Um, 2021, of course, has taught us that. I mean, fintechs were literally jollofing. <laughs> we're jollofing and having a great time. Uh, 2020, before 2021, 2021, when uh, gracious friends at, at CBN, you know, came up with the policies that, you know, started to shake the system gradually. So it was then that we knew that, yes, policies actually have effect um, in the tech, in building a tech, a tech company, and then the crypto stuff came and all that. But um, as an entrepreneur, what you want to do is to be able to um, focus on what you can control while solve, solving the problems. The regulations are there, but you won't fold your arms and say, because there are regulations, you won't try, right? Where there are no regulations, you better keep moving. You better keep moving. After all, there are no regulations or rules to stop you, right? But of course, as you keep moving, you start teaching educators, I mean, regulators now, you start teaching regulators how to become better regulators by coming up with policies. And then you also want to be involved in the policy development process, right? You want to make them your friends because you want to have input in development of such policies just to make sure that those policies um, don't, you know, work against us. I had the privilege of working with the team that um, proposed the um, the Nigerian startup bill, courtesy of the likes of Bosu Tijani and um and uh this guy of of of, of Rabilum valley that's a vgg venture guardian group uh mr bome akiyemiju so he he was the one you know leading the team so we had the privilege of making inputs uh on that so where you find yourself with such platforms you make inputs because i mean these are laws that will affect your business you want to make sure that it is fair and it's something that that favors you but is is the question is will it of course yes it will and in private venture there are no regulations you want to take advantage of of the system like the way the fintechs did before regulations came in and then you can begin to learn you know from that and of course regulators too need to learn um so you want to keep you know taking action to be involved in that process um, and we can take a cue from what Elon Musk has been doing recently so recently I think it was was it last week or two weeks ago um that Elon Musk you know uh literally was educating the government about the need to introduce regulations around AI yeah um this guy has figured out something around AI and he said that this thing can actually go boss if there are no regulations to govern that that process so that is one of the ways we can say we want to get involved in the in the policy development or regulatory you know process right and while not slowing down, but also taking action. So you see these guys taking action, building businesses, you know, um, introducing AI into what, you know, autonomous vehicles, you know, leveraging on what he's done with Tesla is. And then also um, using the opportunity to also um, position himself as a go-to person when coming up with regulations for AI is concerned. You know, right. so some protects the business, also protects the general public. And to your question as to as to around um, recession, of course, Nigeria is in the recession. But let me tell you something about the Nigerian. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a gift. No matter what's going on in Nigeria, Nigerians just know and Nigerians just care. Nigerians just have this gift and that's the ability to survive, right? right? So, so, so Nigerians don't even know whether there's a recession or not. Uh, they could just hear it in the news that there's a recession, but they don't know. And it's just a blessed gift. You know, like a white man, you know, said that he doesn't understand how Nigerians actually do it. Um, like someone is under the rain, is pushing the truck and he's smiling. You know, and it's excited. And, you know, and this is something that would give, you know, maybe a white guy like a, like a heartbreak or maybe confuse him or confuse her, you know, as the case may be. So um, I think it's a gift. I mean, you say that on Instagram, no matter what's going on, you find the guys that are giving us kids, you know, and, tr and trying to make us make us laugh. So I, I think that's a gift that has kind of like controlled the depression rate <laughs> in Nigeria. I mean, if this were to happen in other countries, I mean, there'll be lots of depression. Right. Um, now that brings me to answer, to ask, to ask this question, um, which someone mentioned earlier. How do you identify businesses that um, that will do well during recessions? Because you had mentioned earlier that more billionaires are made during depressions, which we can call a recession, right? Um, and depression does not mean emotional depression. It means, you know, financial it's economic the depression. Of recession. Exactly. So uh, a lot of billionaires are made at that point. Now, how do you as an entrepreneur with forward thinking, how do you spot the industries that will do well for sure during the so that you can position yourself and then maybe milk that opportunity can you speak to that okay um so so what you want to do is number one look at what you're presently doing and see you know how you can latch in on, on that opportunity because 
depression time is is problem period all right and what's a business a business actually is solving problem now um this guy what's his name um jeff bezos jeff bezos became really like his wealth went like this like it was a sharp upward trend during the lockdown because at that point people needed to have things delivered in their homes right the walmarts of this world the tesco's of this world um the sansbury's of this world literally are shut down they were not online right but amazon had been online and so the wealth of jeff bezos literally went up this way the amount of money they were making in thousands of dollars every second on amazon was massive and huge now while others were complaining of lockdown, this guy was literally smiling and getting richer every time. The valuation of Amazon like really went up, like a very sharp upward trend. Zoom also, which we're presently using in this meeting also, by the time Zoom was valued and compared to all airlines around 2021, 2022-ish, the value of Zoom right, was way more than all the airlines combined in valuation. And Zoom is a software product, software as a service product that has no physical, tangible stuff. Compared to an airline company that, I mean, with airplanes and all that, the valuation didn't even match. So it's just saying, as an entrepreneur, how forward thinking are you and what are you seeing when there is a recession or a depression? Are you seeing the recession depression or you are seeing how to profit in the midst of war? For instance, during war times, people who supply ammunition are well there because they're making available. In fact, there are lots of, of wars that, that usually don't exist, and that's no conversation for this place. There are many things going on in Africa, for instance, now that, that um, are actually not the things that, um, what's, the real thing going on is not what we see in the news. The real thing going on behind the scene is because there has to be a justification to allocate resources and to spend money for the Ministry of Defense, right? Because some people have to make a lot of money, right? There's no justification to spend this amount of money until there are literal wars. Um, so we have to create like a pseudo institution and create crisis somewhere to justify the need to spend and deploy and, you know, protest with, with, with people's lives. So um, deliberate problems are created to justify the need for such things. The What we call COVID too. I mean, if we dig deep into it, we'll find some elements of truths and some things that we found out, right? There's need to justify certain things, to deploy resources to this thing we call the big pharma. We have pharmacists, you know, we have to deploy certain, you know, resources that were called vaccines and then just facilitating this. And then you tell us later on that, okay, you actually don't need, you know, vaccines again. Um, after what needs to be achieved has been achieved and move wealth from point A to point B, uh, basically. So um, it's about positioning yourself to understand exactly what the clear problems are um, and seeing differently. If you are not seeing differently, you obviously can't see what to solve. So look, look at the problems and solve them, right? Position yourself in such a way that you can see what the future, you know, looks like. I, I like what, what Harry said. He said the moment, you know, he started hearing of COVID, he just thought, you know, there was going to be a lockdown. And then for all thinking persons, you know that, hey, the way this thing is going, and these guys have been saying it. They've been saying it like, they've been saying it. You could read it in their tone before the actual lockdown that there was going to be. The moment they said it was no more, um, um, there's a language that they use. Uh, the moment they said it, it, it was not a pandemic. The moment World Health Organization said it was a pandemic, the next thing you are going to hear next was that there was going to be a shutdown, like a literal, you know, shutdown. So it's been understanding the time and positioning yourself ahead of it, right? right. Basically. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Steven. Very, very um, quite insightful, insight packed um, there. Now, I want to, someone asked a question regarding customer centricism. Um, Harry, I hope you're still here um, and I'll need you to answer this question. Um, just like we know, especially in the world of products, um, Harry, you're a products guy, Dr. Steven, you're a products person, I'm a products person. We know how important it is to ask customers questions, even more important to make customers co-builders in your product, right? Um, it is, a lot of people talk about how that, oh, you need to make sure you hear from the people that are supposed to use this product, you know, to build the product, right? Now, I want to ask a I want to ask about a dilemma and I want you to just share your own opinion. Now, there's that school of thought. And then there's also the Steve Jobs school of thought where he said, most of the time, customers don't know what they want until you show them. So if you look at it, it sort of looks contradictory. I mean, if you're not digging deep into what those two things mean. So I'd expect that you can shed some lights on this. Ask the customers and then let them co-build what the product is. And then the part where, you know, it's been proven 
really because we look at the iphone for instance or the range of apple products um you know and then the likes of some other products that have been built with that kind of ideology they are doing well in the markets and they are very huge market shareholders um what do you think about that build with the customers or uh, figure out what it is even before the customers know what they want and then sell it to them yeah, so um yeah thanks for that question so i mean it's a very tricky thing to build with customers yeah i know it's, it's a very nice thing to say but it's a very tricky thing to do in the sense that yeah you want to um yes you've heard that quote about if you asked humanity um during the time when the means of mobility was horse if you ask them what they wanted to move they would tell you they wanted a faster uh, horse yeah yeah they would not tell you they wanted a, uh, a a combustion engine that would accelerate their movement faster than a horse and the that's the reality with that's the reality with with users too and with people yeah you want to get data from them from an experiential point of view to know how to improve on that experience but you want to be careful on uh, the whole concept of, yes, I know the idea of building in public or build public is very nice, but at the same time, the reality is that you cannot do every, you cannot build everything uh, based on what they are saying. There are certain things that you might have to make certain calls into building. And just like Dr. Steven said, test. Build, test, then adjust to how they now experience that particular product. Yeah? Um, Google Meets during so at, at the end of the day, your product is really not what you think it is, it is what your user make it is you, it is it is really what your user now decides to do with it. If you get what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. the quote in my head sounded better than that, but I don't the way it came out here. Yeah. I don't mind, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry, yeah, so yeah. Um, the, the but the idea is that you need to, um, you 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 need to learn to build certain things out, but from the foundation of the fact that you are trying to solve a problem you have noticed with them, yeah. Mm. So the data from them is the problem you have noticed people are actually facing. Then at times you might prefer a solution along with your team, test it with them and see the changes you now need to make based on how they are interacting with that product. Let me give an example. During lockdown, um, people learned, people, people, during lockdown, a lot of platforms you would never assume would become schools, became schools, yeah? Mm -hmm. A lot of learning was happening on WhatsApp. Yep. A lot of learning was happening on Telegram. As a matter of fact, Telegram was almost like a school during lockdown for a lot of people, yeah? Google Meets, which was just for meeting few people, became like a classroom for quite a number of people at that point in time. So people tend to like adjust the products to solve their actual problem. And, and it's, it's important for you to now quickly make adjustments based on how they're experiencing it and the use cases they now bring to bear the most on your product and adjust to those realities as fast as you can. Yeah. I'm going to give an example with our e-learning platform, which we launched about six, seven months ago, yeah, um, which is like the next frontier of Trefford that we are currently experimenting with users, yeah. Um, when we launched it, we the goal was to now provide self-paced courses to see how people were actually going to interact, people were going to learn and things like that. But we started realizing that there was a whole lot of people out there currently who are looking to build careers in tech, yeah, but there are so many resources being forced down their throat or being thrown at them without even helping them understand the condition first of these things to not even know if that is the right career path for them in the first place. And we invented something at Trefford called the Startup Park. Startup Park for different learning paths across different local tech roads. Yeah, and within a short time, we realized that we are probably now, we now have over 6K people who have actually from different countries who have accessed those Startup Parks. And they even have created their use cases. For a lot of people, they started coming on Twitter to share that it's been a great refresher course for them. Yeah. So we now have to now even start repositioning some of those courses as a refresher pack for people who are even already in that field and for people who are looking to transition from other fields. Yeah. So it kind of now informed our data and now making sure we now created more starter packs. We started with product management. We have to now do that across many more career paths in tech. And the response has been very, very positive. 
when we are building out our e-learning, we never even knew we were going to do that in the first place. But the fact that we built it and people now tasted what we had there made us realize what they now needed and we now put double down on that route. Right. Right. Um, that's, that's, I think that, that just speaks to it the best way anybody could put it. Um, you should listen to the customers and understand what the problem is, just like you've said, but when it comes to building, they might not necessarily be the best in the best position to tell you exactly what to build. Right. But as far as you understand what the problem is, the roots problem. And then when you use things like the five whys to get to the really, really, really root cause, you can then decide or you can then use that insights to build um, something that works. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, um, Harry. So our time is fast spent. We have some, some more questions um, that we are taking before. Our time is fast spent. It's already 11.32. And I'm craving the indulgence of everybody, speakers and um, you know listeners alike. Um, so just give us a few minutes to round off and then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll call it a, a meeting. We're going to send across the rest of the questions that we have to Dr. Steven and Harry, get their uh, responses to that and then share with everybody um, via email. Harry mentioned he's going to, he's going to share a, um, a document on market size with us that we can also share with the people. Would love to do that. This uh, meeting is recorded, so we'll also send links to everybody um, as, as much as far as you joined or you registered for the uh, events, we'll send the meeting link to you. It's going to be uploaded to YouTube uh, by this weekend or later on Monday, you should have it. Um, we would also try as much as possible to share with everybody Harry and Dr. Stevens' um, handles on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, or Twitter, at, you know, places where they share thoughts and um, you know they interact with people so you can interact with them directly these are people that i know that when you send them messages they'll readily respond if you have more questions you'd like to ask them directly maybe more personal questions to your business you know you can ask them on social media linkedin um, instagram or twitter whichever one you see that it can be very active so we'll share their um their um the links to their profiles as well to you know everybody in the um events uh thank you pack that we usually uh would send so we are coming to the end of the uh webinar today thank you so much for being here harry thank you so much for being here dr steven just before we go i'd like the both of you to just say final words um to the community of entrepreneurs that we have here very vibrant people i tell you people who are doing stuff making things happen in their own space we have a very small tight-knit community but we have guys doing awesome stuff so um just few words um harry you can go first and dr steven um you can go next just few words for your round of words one minute and then um that'll be it harry you got the floor yes yeah, so first of all thanks for having me and um for everyone here who is building uh, one form of business or the other, I think you should also credit yourself. It takes a whole lot of courage to want to build in this current situation. Yes, yeah, so I credit you. I, I want to say uh, well done. Uh, uh, and uh, please, if there are, if you, if you found people who have found your products useful, then it's very possible there are more people from there. Just, um, just adjust to that, having that mindset of making necessary changes to keep serving your people better. But the truth is, if you are in this room and you have built a business, you are currently building a business, man, you 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 are the real MVP and you you deserve some credit. Thank you so much. And I, I pray that in whatever it is you are doing, I pray you find success. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ari. Thank you so much. We also pray that you find success as well. Dr. Steven. All right. So to everyone in the room, first of all, thank you for joining. Um, so this is what I would say. Um, embrace failure as learning. So um the more chances you want to have to succeed, um, the more you must also um, embrace failure, right? The less failures you're experiencing just tells me that you're not trying something new and you're not making a lot of progress. It means you're seeing your comfort zone. So uh, keep trying. Um, that you're failing is a sign that you're learning something. It's a sign that you're actually making progress. It's a sign that you're actually taking steps towards um, angles and avenues that you've never tried before. Um, if you want to achieve one success, at least just make sure that you give yourself nothing less than 10 times, nothing less than that. Keep trying until you get the results. And ultimately you get to your escape velocity mode and you can get the results. So, um, don't give up on yourself. Keep trying. Beautiful. 
Um, again, thank you so much, Harry, for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Steven, for being here. It's been a wonderful time. Uh, we usually would hope that we have more time to, um, to interact with the speakers, but of course, we can always still interact with them either via their personal um, social profiles or social media um, channels, or we would also send um, across um, you know, some more information, including the things that they do where they work and what they do where they work. So again, thank you so much. This brings us to the end of the event today it's been a wonderful time at host now activate um september edition the third quarter for the year and we look forward to you know the next quarter which should probably be sometime in november or december we hope that when we call again dr Stephen harry you would indulge us and come share more insights with um, our community of entrepreneurs again thank you thank you thank you have a wonderful day everybody to everybody who has listened i hope you've learned one or two things please take these insights that you've learned take them into your business go do stuff with it and um, surely surely um, you would record good success enjoy your day everybody have a wonderful weekend and bye-bye Thank you.